where I am nothing, that his voice may be heard. I suggest to you that voice comes when, number one, we are desperate. Uh, somebody else speaking, or is the author simply relating a conversation that he's had? Um, want is duidelijk dat David hier praat van uh, iemand wat vir hom advies gee, hy praat van hulle wat vir hom advies gee om te vlug. So we, we actually have a very simple um, understanding from this psalm, even though it is a difficult psalm to uh, interpret. Difficult in the sense that we do not know the context, we do not know when it was, at which of the few occasions that David had to flee that he was referring to. Uh, there was a time when he was young uh, and when he was being chased by Saul and then there was a time when he was old and he was uh, forced to flee uh, before his own son. En, um, en al by hierdie was pijnlijke hartseer ervaringe gewees. Um, met Saul was het een man na wie hy opgesien het en vir wie hy baie respect gehad het, maar alles het gedraai. En dan sy eie sien, waarin hy met sy eie teleerstellinge gesikkel het, dat hy miskien as pa nie baie goed uh, gedoen het met Absalom nie. So we don't exactly know what the context was, but we, we do understand that some of those that were around him, um, in those early days, of course, there were lots of guys who gathered around him. Many of them were from quite varying backgrounds and some of them not even really people that could be seen as covenant people. So, ouwens wat daar nie berge saam met hom ingevlug het en vir hom bijgestaan het, een van my gunsteling gedeeltes in die, in die geschiedenis van David is die, 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 die helde van hom, ne, die besondere manne wat bereid was om, hulle, hulle sê, dit gaan alles oor jou, dit gaan, gaan oor jou, ons, ons sal vir jou enig iets doen, ons sal, ons sal oor die, oor die, die oceaan swem vir jou, as het ware, as die mens het so kan stel. So, it could have been those, that were saying to him, dis tyd om nou pad te gee, om, om net te vlug. Misschien was het, selfs nog vroeger, toe hy en Jonathan nog vriende was, en, voordat Saul sy dinge begin gebeur het, maar precies wie dit was wat vir hom hierdie raad gegee het, dit weet ons nie, maar David vertel dit, en ek het al met die vraag geworstel, hoe, uh, hoe het hy, hoe het dit hom geaffecteer? Um, nou kan ek seker dit andruk, nee. Daar is hy. So, hoe is, hoe is David affecteer dier dit wat hierdie ouwens vir hom sê, want hulle sê ook vir hom, dit is baie ernstig, hulle sê die, die, die peil is al getrek, uh, een kommentaarskryver sê, you have the gun uh, against your head, so this is the seriousness of the threat, so you have to flee, jy moet pad gee, um, en ek dink David is geraak dier dit, dis hoekom hy dit in hierdie psalm opskryf, Um, dit het definitief in sy binneste uh, weerklank gevind. En daarom kom ook sy reaksie nie. Nee, ek sal nie vlug nie, ek gaan God vertrouw ook in die situasie. Um, die sê soos wat jy vind in die geschiedenis oor Nehemia, um, waar die vrande uh, van Nehemia en volk van God vir hom kom sê, hy moet, hy moet vlug, hy moet in die tempel invlug, en dan, dan vraag hy die vraag, sal a man, a man like I flee, sal een soos ek pad gee? Um, there is also an indication that this was about what Jesus faced when Simon Peter, in all his wisdom, told the Son of God that uh, this is, uh, it's not necessary for you to go to Jerusalem and to die there. No, you must uh, resist this. And Jesus had to speak very uh, sternly towards him. So, uh, Christus' uh, reaksie teen oor Simon Petrus. En dan, die, die psalm, as ek om baie kortliks kan saamvat, dan uh, sê David eindelijk, dat God is op die troon, vir my nogal betekenisvol, 
is dat hij sê, dat hij is op die troon in die tempel, en hij is op die troon in die hemel. So when you look at God being enthroned above the heavens and above the universe, that's the universal picture that you have of God's enthronement. But then for those who worship Him, those who love Him, those who belong to Him, those who come to Him, to be in His presence, it's also important to know that He is enthroned in the temple. Ook in die plek waar ons met hom moet, waar ons as gelovig is met hom in gemeenskap kom, is dit so betekenisvol. Um, it's important for us to also note that he mentions the foundations in um, as jy uh, probeer verstaan wat bedoel David met uh, fondaties, jy kry in die oud testament aanduidings daarvan, en uh, wil jy of ons meer ook wat dit kan sê, but it has this meaning of the settled order of things. Um, dit, wat, dit wat ordelik gaan, dit wat in plek gesit word, dit wat beginsels is, dit wat waardes is, uh, dit wordt met die, die fondaties bedoel, want in werkelijkheid is dit wat die raadgever vir David sê, um, dat as jy kyk na die politiek, dan is dit jou, jou, jou bevinding, dat, uh, dat die waardes is daarmee heen, uh, die beginsels wat voor ons belangrijk is, dit het in die slag geblei, uh, en as jy kyk na die innerlijke beweegredes van mense, so the value system, that has been affected, ek draai miskien een bykie weit as ek dit gaan sê, maar dit is the settled order of things. Nou as ons nou in ons opzet vandag kyk, society uh, in uh, Psalm 11 is likened to a building, its foundation is law and order, justice and truth. Um, and if these are undermined, then this question comes up, and um, daar is selfs die gedachte dat, dat hier die vraag, kry nie eindelike antwoord in Psalm 11 nie. Uh, David het nie rechtige antwoord vir dit wat hier die raadgever vir hom vraag nie. As dit nou gebeur, wat gaan die rechtverdige doen, want die vraag is eindelijk deel van die advies wat vir hom gegee is. What can the righteous do? And there's no real answer coming out of what David writes. So he actually takes another direction. He verts to that which is his inner faith foundation. Dit wat om die binnenkant bepalend is. En um, ek wil he ons my net vinnig dier dit beweeg, ons weet hoe David in Psalm 111 gesê het, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and uh, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Um, en uh, en, en hy, hy het die beleidnis gehad, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. So dis die, dis a paar aanhalings wat aandui waar sy innerlijke equilibrium geleed, sy binneste evenwig, the knowledge that God is the eternal one and I belong to him and I rest in his hand. Ek het a baie dierbare broer daar in die gemeente gehad daar in die kaap, hy is nou al in die hemel uh, en, en hy het een dag by a by eenkomst waar ons saam in die kerk was, het hy gesê, dit was of die Heer net vir my in my stilte tyd gewees het, hoe groot is sy hand. Hy sê, en, en ek sê, kan rechtig maar gaan sit in sy hand, en ek kan net so gaan terug sit en weet, hy dra my. And I think it's something of that picture that David is trying to relate uh, here. Um, ek het ook een baie dierbare sister in diezelfde gemeente en sy leven nog, sy is al uh, tamelijk gevorder op die pad en sy verjaar saam met my die 8ste april en as ek nou vir vir Sibbel bel en ek vraag vir Sibbel 
so wil ek hoor die kinders sê, jy sê so lekker nie, hoe gaan het? En sê sy, ach, dominee, die Heere is op die troon. <laughs> so it's this, it is this internal assurance. Uh, dit waar jy in Abed dan sy wending neem. Maar nou is het baie belangrik, dat ons nie maar net tevrede is, dat hier binnenkant het ek vrede, en nou gee ek nie om verder nie, daar is een nodigheid om een balans in die situasie te handhaaf. Uh, ek haal hierdie aan, some quite correctly quoted scriptures in saying that Jesus Christ is the foundation and he cannot be destroyed, soos wat ons, ek denk, die sê jy het gelees vir oogend, daar het 1 Korintiërs 3, wat een wonderlijke aanhaling en groot waarheid. But in the context in which this verse from Psalm 11 is used, we are talking about the foundational knowledge upon which our moral framework is built. The foundational knowledge. So it is meer as net a geestelike innerlijke waarin jy kan rus. The foundational knowledge of Jesus Christ as creator can be removed in people's thinking. Whether they are from Australia, America, England, waar ook al. This action does not mean that Jesus Christ is not creator, nor does it mean that he has been dethroned. However, it does mean that in those nations and those societies and those communities that abandon this foundational basis, the whole fabric of society will suffer the consequences. So dis die balans wat ons ook moet behou, en dis die ding wat ek verlede, ons hier was, een jaar gelede, wat ek vir Simon so waardeer het, dat hy vir ons gesê het, ons moet nie net geestelik oor hierdie ding dink nie. It's not sufficient to just be spiritual and seek for a spiritual way out of it. But we need to act in obedience, which is part of faith, obedience and faith as karperde, so part of our faith and trust in God is the obedience to his word to be the pillar uh, and the defense of the truth. So, uh, this is very important to this balance. I want to not say about her life. I think that this is by us, for all in the network, is it so important um, in Iemand het al hier, ek dink Karel, jy het verwijs na kere wat daar herleving uitgebreek het. Interesting thing is that there have been times in history, the history of the church where the foundations were crumbling. En dan het die wat aangegryp is in laarte, het begin om dier gebed God vast te gryp. En te sê, jyre, dis, dis skrikwekkend die die ding. Uh, rechtig passievol in gebed na die Heere te draai. Maar daar is een tweede aspect ook in dit, en dit is dat jy die woord van God er opneem and you start applying it to the situation. Because God has given us the word to preach the word, to proclaim the word, to teach the word, to disciple with the word, and so we need to apply the word of God. So prayer needs to also see us applying the word of God to the realities of our situation. And then I, I want to also add to that, that um, you mentioned this morning about the gifts. And, um, and you know, the, the, the genade gaves wat God in sy gemeente gegeet, uh, as jy nou mooi gaan kyk na die genadegaves, dan, dan staan een baie sterk uit, en dit is genadegaves wat met leierskap verband hou. En dis baie keer wat nodig is. Jy kan, jy kan maar net bezig wees om te verkondig en te bid. Maar daar is een nodigheid vir mense wat gaves, besondere gaves van God ontvang het, om op te staan en te lei, to lead, to lead the church to the place where it again be filled with, with life, vitality, and with the empowerment and the fruitfulness that God intended for it. 
En dis wat jy kry in die sieve gemeentes in klein Asie ook, as die Heere vir hulle briewe skryf, dan, dan praat hy met die leiers, hulle moet iets doen. So there is a sense in which we need to pray, and a sense in which we need to teach and preach and proclaim, and uh, busy ourselves with the word of God, but then there is also a need for us to lead. And that means you take that company of whom you have been given responsibility, that you take them from where they are to where they should be, by the grace of God. Um, so, uh, uh, ons kan oor die herlevings praat, so, um, die prentje het ek gedink, pas mooi hier by Joa Dogon right, Christians have standards of right and wrong, and uh, why? Because of their world view, God as creator has direct ownership over his creation. Corinthians 1 Corinthians 6, Know ye not, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So because humans are created beings, they are under obligation to the one who has absolute authority over them. So dit gaan nou ook om mense wat nie eers die Heere Jesus ken en erken nie, dat ook oor hulle het hy gesag. Um, thus, what is right, what is wrong is not a matter of anyone's opinion, but must be in accord with the principles found in the word of God. En uh, daarom is ons besorg daar oor dat die fondaties word ondergrawe, ek gaan hierop in nie, want iemand gaan sekerlik oor dit praat van uit die, die jonger geslag, uh, oor die gesin, um, many parents fail to lay proper foundation at home, um, en uh, daar oor, denk ek, kan ons ook in die tyd gesels. Maar laat ek afsluit my gedeelte wat inleidend is, um, Francis Schaefer, uh, spoke at a church, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, met wie ek baie mooi stuk pad met die EE3 bediening geloop het, and in 1982, uh, he spoke there, and um, his book that became so famous, a Christian manifesto, was just in manuscript form at that stage, and so het baie in sy preek oor dit verwees, En dit is van die woorde wat hy gesê het, en ek sluit met dit af. We have forgotten our heritage. A lot of the evangelical complex like to talk about the old revivals, and they tell us we ought to have another revival. We need another revival. You and I need revival. Sila. But they have forgotten something. Most of the Christians have forgotten and most of the pastors have forgotten something. That is the factor that every single revival that has ever been a real revival, whether it was the Great Awakening before the American Revolution, whether it was the great revivals of Scandinavia, whether it was Wesley and Whitfield, wherever you have found a great revival, it's always had three parts. First, it has called for the individual to accept Christ as Savior. And thankfully, in all of these that I have named, thousands have been saved. Second, it has called upon the Christians to bow their hearts to God and really let the Holy Spirit have his place in fullness in their life. But there has always been in every revival a third element. It has always brought Social change. So die fondaties is weer recht opgestel. I think the church has failed to meet its obligation in these last 40 years for two specific reasons. Nou, dit is alweer nog 40 jaar verder, so is nou 80 jaar gelede wat hy dit gesê het. The first, um, nie nou het ek hier lekker getel nie, maar toe maar. The first is this false truncated view of spirituality that doesn't see true spirituality touching all of life. The other thing is that too many Christians, whether they are doctors, lawyers, pastors, evangelists, whatever they are, too many of them, too many of them are afraid to really speak out because they do not want to rock the boat for their own project. As dominis wat hulle wil nie die boot rock nie. So moet nie te radikaal oor hierdie goed praat nie. 
I am convinced that these two reasons, both of which are a tragedy and really horrible for the Christian, are an explanation of why we have walked the road we have walked in the last 40 years. We must understand it's going to cost you to take a stand on these things. There are doctors who are going to get kicked out of hospitals because they refuse to perform abortions. There are nurses that see a little sign on a crib that says, do not feed, and they feed and they are fired. There's a cost. But I'd ask you, what is loyalty to Christ worth to you? How much do you believe this is true? Why are you a Christian? Are you a Christian for some lesser reason? Or are you a Christian because you know that this is the truth of reality? And then, how much do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? How much are you willing to pay the price for loyalty to the Lord Jesus? And I will graag vraag Daniel, jy is om die eerste aan die woord en ons het net nou gehoor Daniel werk met studenten en ek het so al langs aan hom voorbij beweeg in Brooklyn en Jy het nie een powerpoint nie, so hy het dit nie nodig nie. Dankie. Ek kan net vir jou die microfoon gee, nie. Is hij aan? Kan hij zeggen? Um, I'm going to be speaking in English just to hear yeah, for some of the English brothers and sisters here. So, um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Richard, for the invitation to be here this morning. Um, like Richard just mentioned, I met him in, I think it was 2018 when he uh, he uh, basically performed his ministry work and his calling in our church with um, um, all our ministers there. So that's where I met Richard. Um, now I just, I want to share some, uh, just briefly share some of the things from my experience and some of the thoughts um, as to how I think we as Christians must do something about the things that we are facing um, in the society and in churches today. Now, just as I've mentioned earlier, I'm involved with uh, the Rasha Christie ministry. It's, a, it's an apologetic student's ministry with Simon. I've met Simon in uh, Poch of Sturm when I was still doing my finishing my theological studies. And um, by the time I was almost finished, uh, there were some some voices who said that we need Rasha Christie in Pretoria at the University of Pretoria, and uh, then discussions began as to how we can make that happen in partnership with uh, Reformed Church Brooklyn. So I'm also then the minister there. Now, from both of these ministries, uh, as I'm involved at Reformed Church Brooklyn and also at Rasha Christie. I've had many conversations with uh, concerned parents who are very worried about their children studying in a secular environment and how they have so many questions about sexuality, um, the progressive ethic that we see in secularism, and then also just questions about the person and the work of Jesus, the reliability of the Bible. And, um, and so I've, I've had many conversations with concerned parents and then also I deal weekly with Christian and non-Christian students. The Christian students come from the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church. I've, I, I know a couple of Dutch Reformed theological students who come to my house regularly. Um, in fact, one of my tenants in my backyard is a theological student at Tux. Um, and then also the Reformed Church, the, the, um, some Pentecostal churches. So I also then deal weekly, on a weekly basis with these students. 
And then we also welcome, like I said, non-Christian students to come and attend our events and participate in the conversation that we have there. Now, from all my discussions with all these uh, different people, the fact is, as Richard has already mentioned, the, the foundations are being undermined. The Christian foundations that we would say have upheld uh, society for so long are drastically being undermined, especially um, at the universities. Now, the problem is that young Christians aren't pre prepared to face up to these challenges. Uh, uh, William Wilberforce, the British politician and also the, uh, the leader of the movement against slavery, he already diagnosed this problem in the 18th century in his book called Real Christianity. Uh, and he was very concerned about the effects of a mere cultural Christianity and how that cultural Christianity would uh, impact society in the long run. And he also said, uh, well, he particularly blamed Christian parents. He was, you blamed them because they didn't instruct their Christian children uh, in the foundations of the Christian faith. And they also did not furnish them with arguments to be able to defend that faith. And this is what he said. He said, when Christianity is viewed in a hereditary way, just passed down from parents to children, intelligent and energetic young men and women will undoubtedly reach a point where they question the truth of Christianity. And when challenged, will abandon this inherited faith that they cannot defend. They might begin to associate with peers who are unbelievers. In this company, they will, f uh, they will find themselves unable to intelligently respond to objections to Christianity with which they are confronted. Had they really known what they believe and why they believe it, these kinds of encounters would not shake their faith one bit. Now, I think his diagnosis is right. What he's saying here is happening at universities. Both the Christian parents as well as Christian leaders must therefore teach their youth not only to know what they believe, but especially also why they believe it. Now consider a study that was done um, in South Africa which focused particularly on the decline of membership in Protestant denominations in this country. It mentioned things like this, uh, the, in the influence of secularism, individualism, absent Christian parents, uh, a decline in people's understanding of God, so no just superficial theology, an increase in unbelief, and the fracturing effects of postmodernism. These are just among just some of the things that's listed in the article that causes the decline in church membership and we would say then the decline in Christians who's not able to be to face up to the challenges that these factors present. And then, taken as a package, I think all of these factors led to the rise of what some people would call an anti-intellectualism in the church. Now, make no mistake, I don't think the solution to this is intellectualism. But the, the, the fact is there's an anti-intellectualism in churches. Um, I mean, how many I've heard this so many times when I've grown up, just have faith like a child. Uh, and I still hear it today that that's promoted as if it's a, a virtuous thing to promote for small children. Just have faith. Don't ask these questions. In fact, if you were to really be like children, where this phrase is, apparently comes from, it's rather, Jesus says, become like children, not have faith like a child. If you examine children, they ask what questions? They ask what, why questions? But they never ask whether questions, whether they exist, or whether they really can really know the encounter with reality that they have. They only begin to ask those questions when they're exposed to secular philosophy. So we must we must become like children in that sense. Now <clears throat> and then to have faith like a child has also been introduced to get oneself off the hook when you have to answer a difficult question. But this anti-intellectualism has especially been um, referred to as a disposition to discount the importance of truth and the life of the mind in the soul. 
And I think that's important. It has been characterized by superficial or bad theology, the lack of apologetics on a local level at local churches, and also just the lack of a constructive public philosophy to engage the issues of our day. And so, yes, the, the, these foundations are being undermined. Now, my role at Reformed Church Brooklyn and also at Rasha Christie is to do what Wilberforce was emphasizing then, that is to not just te teach youth to know what they believe, but also why they believe it. And that naturally leads to the act of also loving God with our minds is to know why, and that is when we know why we believe it. And the way we practically do this, at least in my context in Pretoria, how we practically do this is to create different um, events, weekly events, where we come together and we have uh, lectures, discussions, and it's an, pla an open platform. That's why we welcome non-Christian students or youth there as well, where we can ask questions and just engage each other on these different um, questions that we might have. At Rasio Christi, we started this year doing a series on worldviews. The, the book that we used as our textbook was, was a James Sires book, the, the Universe Next Door, where we started with deism, and then we moved to atheism, nihilism, existentialism, pantheism, new age, modernism, and Islam. And as we go through all these different worldviews, it really gives the students a sense of the history of ideas and how it shapes society in the future. So if someone has a bad idea, you have to be able to point that out to the person and point them back to truth. So this series on worldviews really helped with that. It allowed the students to understand this, the history of ideas, and also that the Christian worldview makes the best sense of reality. And then after this series, we, we partnered with a local church in Pretoria where we did a series titled Questions That Won't Go Away. The church did a survey where they asked all the church members to write down the questions that sort of fundamental to them. And we used that survey as a basis to, to do this uh, series called Questions That Won't Go Away. And we did the following questions was the questions that all that survey was basically reduced to this, these five questions. Um, what ho happens to those who haven't heard the gospel? Is the Bible reliable? Is it, is it God's inspired word? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Um, isn't God an egomaniac to demand worship? And then why does God allow suffering and evil? And we spend one week on each one of these different questions. And I would either prepare something myself or I would invite a guest lecturer or a guest speaker to come and present something and we would always make enough time for questions and, and answers. I think John Grobler, he, he did the one on evil and suffering at my Rasha Krista chapter um, during that series. And um, the series that we're beginning now is called, we called it Our Strange New World, titling it after Carl Truman's latest book, which is titled Our Strange New World. And, um, and there we're, gonna, we're, we're going through the institutions of society, starting with the family. What is the family? Why is the family important? And then one week on that, and then the second week on what's the nature of the world's attack on the family in this day and age. And so I, I presented a lecture on the second week on the effects of the sexual revolution on family life, and then also the effects of the Marxian notion of the abolishment of the family on family life. The next institution we're going to be doing next week would be the church. What is the church? Why is the, what's the calling of the church? What's the nature of the attack on the church? And then we'll end with the university. Um, so that's the series we're currently doing. Now at Brooklyn Church we have a Monday evening event called Kopscape, Mind Shift, where um, we have a couple of congregants who concerned parents and also some young students who see the need for it where we do much the same kind of work uh, uh, in fact th there's it's only I only do it in Afrikaans there and um, the what what happened at Brooklyn is what, what we also immediately saw is the need for teaching apologetics to children and so my mom is helping me with uh, 
trying to get something off the ground when it comes to teaching apologetics to young children. We approached a, a lady who did a doctoral work on the development phases of children, and so we, we're trying to use those development phases as um, the, 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 the key factor, and then how we can accommodate apologetic literature to those, make it, make it applicable to tho- those different developmental phases of a child. And we're doing five-minute videos on each. So that's just the beginning. I'm really hoping and praying that that would develop. But my mom is the one doing those, doing the, the re- most of the research. They're reading the, the apologetic scholars who's trying to write books for children. So that's, that's also what we're trying to get off the ground. And so far it has actually been, been going very well. Uh, and then at the moment they were also doing this uh, series on the world's attack on the institutions, especially family, the church, and the university. And uh, I, in, in all these events and s- things that we are busy with, um, I've really seen how students have sort of realize the need for, for apologetics and, and why they need to know why they believe what they believe as Christians and as this anti-intellectualism that's in the church, how they need to have a constructive public philosophy to engage with the questions surrounding sexuality, especially um, in our day and age. Now, to be sure, we will make many best- mistakes on this road as we try to figure out how to best do this, what's the best day, way to go forward. But um, I've been very grateful for being involved with with Rasha Christie and Simon, who has taught me so many things as well, um, uh, put me in so many difficult positions. But um, I'm very grateful for all of those opportunities that I've been able to have. And I just want to end with this. This is from J.P. Moreland. Um, he re- he's written a book called Loving Your God with All Your Mind. And we're going to work through that book next year uh, on the Monday evening platform at Brooklyn Church because I've read the, the, his book this year and I realized how he, he diagnoses the problem. Yes, it is applied to a, a, the, um, the, the um, American context. But as I've read through it, I've realized time and time again this is alive and well here as well. This is also an issue here. So it's very relevant to our, um, con- make no mistake, it's very relevant to our context as well. Um, so we'll be working through that book n- next year. But he, he, he writes this, and, and one more thing, he makes, he diagnoses the problem, but he, pr- he provides very practical solutions. So I also want actually our whole minister team at Brooklyn Church to work through it at some point. But he, uh, he writes this, he says, Apologetics is a New Testament ministry of helping people overcome intellectual obstacles that block them from coming to or growing in the faith by giving reasons for why one should believe Christianity is true and by responding to objections raised against it. Then he says, Local church after local church should be raising up and training a group of people who serve as apologists for the entire congregation. And I think this is sort of what we're trying to do at Brooklyn Church and also um, what Rasha Christie has really been helping with as they also partner with uh, local churches. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Still morning. Morning. If I haven't uh, greeted you yet, um, thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you on just what is concerning at the moment regarding family life and marriage in particular. And um, I prepared in English because I didn't know how to. African Christian Network is English, so. But anyway, so for those people from, from Natal, where I've ministered in those hill countries for many years, 
Uh, I've learned to speak English and preach in English as well. So, yeah, it's a pleasure. I want to start off with three statements that I'd li- just like to throw out there. Um, I believe these are true. It's obviously open for discussion. Not here, but later on, maybe. But in my humble opinion, the health of a nation is not determined by its leaders per se, but rather by the homes and the health of the family homes they come from. The health of a nation is not to be measured by the value of their currency or the value of their natural resources, but by the wholesome values taught in homes by caring parents. The spiritual health of a nation can never be determined by the number of church buildings or the, religious, the level of religious freedom afforded to people or even the amount of people professing to be of the Christian faith. The spiritual health of a nation starts at home. There where fathers and mothers take up the responsibility to make disciples and they start with those that God gave in their care, their children. Our nation is in a crisis. I'm not talking about the energy crisis or the corruption crisis that keeps and continues to plague our nation. I'm not talking about the lawlessness crisis or the crime crisis, not the debt crisis. I'm talking about the crisis of the breakdown of the family. And more specifically within the family, I refer specifically to the tremendous pressure and the crisis the institution of marriage is currently facing. Marriage is the God-ordained starting block for every family. Family is the smallest building block of society. If you break society down, you get to family, which is the smallest building block of it. And as families go, so goes society. And as marriages go, so goes family. So how is marriage doing in South Africa? This graph gives us an indication of just how the number of marriages on a year-to-year basis from 2011 to 2019, eight years, has been declining. From 2011 to 2019, and I don't take into account 2020 because it's just, it was just a crazy year. Can't really read anything into those stats. But there has been an average year-on-year decrease in the number of civil marriages between a, a man and a woman of 3.5%. So that means that every year there were 3.5% less marriages that were registered in our nation than the previous year. It's therefore clear that less and less people are getting married, yet the population keeps growing. So what that means is that more and more children are born outside of marriage, which creates a huge problem because marriage gives safety in a home. Apart from people less interested to get married and rather cohabitating and and wanting and enjoying all the benefits of marriage, especially sex, divorce adds to the woes in families. Currently, South Africa's divorce rate stands at 17.6%. That's almost one in five marriages that doesn't last. Now, although the number has been coming down in the last decade or so, in parity with the dropping marriage rate, divorce adds to the cracks in family life and divorce may well influence the reason why many young people say, I don't want to get married. Because they live through the pain of that in their own homes. But there are two things about divorce that I would like to mention here. And the first one is that 44% of divorces happen in the first 10 years of marriage. So that means marriage doesn't even last 10 years. For 44% of them, it doesn't even get to the stage of 10 years, a decade. And the second thing is, sadly, the divorce rate is no different 
inside the church. It's the same. Same numbers. There are undoubtedly serious cracks that have formed in family life in South Africa. And that is why uh, we've been involved with uh, a ministry called Family Foundations um, for a number of years now, for nine years, and why we started up a ministry called Crosspoint Family Consultants two months before lockdown hit. We started that. And it was really like, God, did we hear you correctly? Is this what you want us to do? Um, but we are seeing God using us in, in many different ways, and I'll elaborate a bit on that in a moment. But working with, working with families on a daily basis, we see the effects of these numbers. We see the effects and the, and the cracks that's there. And you know, cracks are indications that something's wrong. Cracks are indication that something needs attention. And cracks point to movement or problems in the structure and points to problems in the foundation, what we are talking about today. Psalm 11 verse 3, we heard it read just now. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, what do you do when there are problems in foundations? What do contractors do? They go and they, how do I go back? There. They go and they dig it up. They dig open the foundations and they strengthen those foundations. They make sure those foundations are secure. In the next couple of moments, I want to share with you three things that I believe we, as the church, as the body of Christ, as God's righteous believers, as followers of Jesus, as disciples of our Lord, that we need to do when we see the collapse of foundations in family life and marriage. The first one is this. We as the church need to get back to recognizing and defending God's design for marriage and family life. If you think about design, everything in this room has design. This table has a design. That glass in front of you has got a design. Someone thought about it and then designed it and it was made. Without design, there's no functionality of anything. Nothing will work without design. And if we tamper with design, you may run into trouble. If, if I take a computer, which I don't understand anything about, but I go and take it apart to try and think I'll make it better, I'll mess it up if I'm not the one that designed it, that doesn't know how it works. The same goes for family life. The same goes for marriage. There is a design and there is a designer. God is the designer, and without the design, it becomes dysfunctional. God thought of it, He designed it, and He gave it to us to work with. And you temple with a design that God has given, and it breaks. I would say God has exclusive rights on marriage and family life. He's got the IP, the intellectual property. No one can go and change that and call it the same thing. It just doesn't work that way. Intellectual property you don't touch. Yet we are seeing that it's been touched. What God has instituted, what God has given, it's been touched and it's been ridiculed and it's been chopped and changed. God made and designed marriage and He made it to be something breathtakingly beautiful if the design is followed. Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says, This is what the Lord says, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And then go and read, Israel said, We will not walk in it. And go and see how downhill it went for there, from, there, from that point on. We are at a crossroads for some years now regarding family life in South Africa. We need to get back to God's ancient paths. Ancient paths are not old-fashioned ways. It's the tried and tested God-given ways of how things are supposed to work. Another word for design is blueprint. Every house, every structure, every, everything that's built, every building has got a blueprint. It's got a plan. It's got a, a design. And the, 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 the designer, the architect, draws that up, 
thinks it out, puts it on paper, gives it to the engineers, gives it to the, to the builders, and they build according to that design. They do exactly what that design says. And it is crucial that they follow it for the safety of that structure and for the structural integrity of that building. Marriage has a blueprint. Genesis 2 verse 24 says, Therefore a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they will become one flesh. It is a blueprint that God has given and that He created, He designed. This is the blueprint. One plus one. One man and one woman becomes one for life. You mess with that, and the world mess with that, we have trouble, like we see happening right now. This has been a design from creation. It works until someone starts to mess with it. It has two restrictions. It's one man, one woman. And it's got a lifetime, lifetime, a time frame committed to it or established by it for life. The world's view on marriage is highly compromised, blurring the lines, media and movie influences. They, they promote loose relationships and adultery, lust and falling in and out of love, creating havoc in relationships starting already in primary school now, where children are being, being taught all the dating kind of things and, and those kind of things starting to, to creep in. We need to understand that marriage is a sacred and a holy institution. Sacred means set apart, not to be touched, not to be messed with. We should not mess with something that is called sacred. And there's a strong drive worldwide and even in South Africa to get the Marriage Act rewritten. So it includes all the other kinds of um, possibilities and other relationships as well. With every move to change marriage to what the world thinks it should be, we are walking away and turning our back on what God says about marriage. And moving away from God's design weakens family life. It weakens society. It weakens the church. Let me tell you why. Because it rips away the creative purpose and the calling of humanity that God has given to people to, to rule and to be on this earth, to multiply and to make disciples, all these kind of things, it gets ripped away when we change what God has given. Adam and Eve moved away from what God intended for them in, in the garden. They were put outside the garden and they, they were sold a lie and they lost their authority to rule. With every marriage that ends in divorce, the authority given by God to a husband and a wife to be stewards of blessing and life within that family context shifts to the kingdom of darkness to destroy and to bring devastation. Let me read to you what Wikipedia says. Not a Christian book, not a Christian website. Wikipedia says about the institution of holy marriage. Marriage is a divine institution that can never be broken, even if the husband or wife legally divorce in the civil courts, as long as they are both alive, the church considers them bound together by God. Holy matrimony is another name for sac sacramental marriage. That's what Wikipedia says about marriage. That's how high it's held in regard. How many churches still go by that? As long as two people are still alive, they're married. There's a covenant in place between those two people. It's crucial that we as the church again understand marriage as God made it to be. We are the guardians of God's design for marriage. This is the first thing. That we stand by the blueprint and design for marriage and we teach it. The second thing is how do we do that? How do we teach that? We need to understand and teach that marriage is a covenant and not a contract. You know, covenant is something that is largely misunderstood in our modern day culture and dare I say in the church at large. 
not an understanding of what covenant really means. Covenant is the solemn vow made between a man and a woman on their wedding day. Covenants are not meant to be broken. Covenants are for life. The problem is that many people think that because they signed a register on their marriage day, on their wedding, that they think they've entered a contract with something that goes to home affairs and gathers dust or eaten by moths or put on some hard drive that can crash. But those promises or those vows that the man and woman made to each other, that's what binds them together. A vow that is heard, recorded, and ratified in the courts of heaven where God is the one who designed it. Matthew 19, verse 6, Jesus said, What God, God joined together, let no one separate. Marriage can be seen as a contract. Marriage can be seen as a covenant. And those two views have very different characteristics, viewpoints, and implications. And even though talking about this is one of my favorite subjects and why we take couples on retreats um, and taught, te teach them these things, I don't have the time to go into them, but I'll give you one, the one that's maybe most misunderstood about covenants. And that is what breaks a covenant and what breaks a contract. What breaks a contract? Many things. Disagreements, unhappiness on one side of both, both parties. If the, if the party does not hold the agreement, they can call it, the contract can be called null and void. What breaks a covenant? There's one thing, and one thing only that breaks a covenant, that will ever break a covenant. Death. Death is the, death is the only thing that breaks a covenant. That is why at weddings we hear, and maybe you can remember, you maybe said this on your wedding, and if you're a marriage officer, we lead people to say this, if we use a tra traditional marriage vows, until death us do part. That's covenant language written by someone many, many years ago that still understood that marriage is a covenant. It's for life. The church needs to teach that marriage is a covenant. It was never meant to operate on the grounds of a contract where we have the right to walk away when it no longer suits us. The third and final point I want to make is that we need to equip parents to raise kingdom-minded children. Apart from lovingly bringing people back to what God had in mind with marriage, we need to help parents and equip them so that they can raise children in their God-given assignment. God loves all children. Jesus made this clear one day when he stopped, and we heard this verse already referenced today, Matthew 18, verse 2 to 6. He says, whoever re receives a child in my name receives me but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea in our nation in our communities in our homes today fathers and mothers stepdads and stepmoms uncles and aunts grandpas and grandmas carers are unfortunately causing many children to turn their backs on God. Causing them to run towards the world to seek and find what they never received at home. Acceptance, love, the nurture and care of a mother, the example, the guidance, the encouragement and loving discipline of a father. Mentors, help, hope, a hero, blessing, identity, a sense of destiny, and something to live for. And our leaders scratch their heads in our nation. Wondering why South Africa currently is the country with the third highest rape rate in the world. Why drug lords are destroying our children. Why we have gangsterism ravaging many parts of our country. Why corruption is so rife. Why teenage pregnancy is so high. Why abortion is so in demand. And why Cape Town is rated as the 10th most dangerous city to live in in the world. Why? You take a look at the family and you'll know why. You see the amount of fatherlessness in our nation and you'll know why. About one-fifth of all children in South Africa don't live with their parents. Children need healthy homes, 
And that's why this is the third thing I believe that we as the church need to address as we seek to fix the foundations that have been destroyed. We need to call and challenge parents to be God's agents in their children's lives. We need to call parents to take up their responsibility. We need to call fathers to man up and be there for their children. We need to call moms to understand the importance of early childhood development. We need to equip parents to deal with their own hurts so that they can help their children grow further than they ever got. Parents hold keys to lock or unlock doors for their children. Parents hold keys to bless or to curse their children. Parents need to be taught and equipped to recognize life at the moment of conception when God starts to weave an individual life together. Parents need to be taught and equipped about the sanctity of life, how to pray for their unborn children, proclaiming life over them. That they know that there is power in the name or names given to a child at birth. How to raise godly children, how to discipline their children appropriately, how to navigate the teen years and make it something special and not something awkward. How to bless a child and how to release a child into and towards adulthood by way of a special ceremony. And how to raise kingdom-minded children, which I define as, as, as the following, where a child will say, it's not about me, it is about God. It's not about my world, it's about God's. It's not about success, it's about significance. It's not about money, it's about faith. It's not about a job, it's about a calling. It's not about me first, it's about putting God and others first. It's not about climbing the corporate ladder. It's about doing what God designed me to do, even if it me means holding the ladder for someone else. It's not about building my kingdom. It's about allowing God's kingdom to come in and through my life. It's not about me and Jesus. It's about Jesus in me. At Crosspoint, we to reach families through marriage coaching and various um, times we talk to, to married couples and we've got an engaging covenant course that we run for those who are seeking to be guided in how to go about into marriage, how to enter marriage. We do parent blessing workshops, teaching parents how to bless their children, teaching grandparents how to bless their grandchildren and just carry on that wave of blessing into their lives. If we don't address these things, these three things, the slippery slope that we are currently on will tilt even more and become a cliff that we'll no longer be able to hold on to. I thank you. Erna said that. Um Eindelijk moes Zanel ook hier gewees het, nou Zanel het nou het een baie belangrike verantwoordelijkheid die na week, so sy moes kanseleer om saam te kom. In die oor. Ek het jou vrou so oor gekry. Mooi. Mooi vrou. Um, uh, it's such a privilege uh, to be with you, uh, and so I, I think I have the answer to the question, what must the, the righteous do when the foundations are crumbling, or we, we think we do, um, we just plant churches. <laughs> Long churches, <laughs> long churches where we, we have a lot of people that's able to not only know what they believe, but why they, they believe what they believe. And, and to have churches that's filled with, in the core, healthy families, but that's able to invite the broken families into those, um, those spaces. So, uh, my name is Thomas, uh, this is Erna. We, uh, we've uh, been um, uh, part of 
cross culture church or called by the Reformed Church Randburg to, to plant this community. And for the last year, it's, it's been long in the making. For the last year uh, or so, we've been full time uh, uh, trying to lead this ministry into a full fledged uh, a local Reformed, uh, Reformed church. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we will talk a bit, a bit more about our name and our calling and why we are cross-culture church in our talk. Um, so a few disclaimers. I'm going to add one. Just <laughs> click there. The first one is um, that we are doing this talk in English. Um, and uh, I remember when we did a church planting conference or actually a, a well, whole course of six weeks, um, the the American person that helped us there said, but how can you plant a multicultural church in English if you're Afrikaans speaking? But I don't think they know how it works in South Africa. Yeah, we have grace for each other, so if the <laughs> tenses are mixed up, that's fine. <laughs> so um, the first <coughs> disclaimer that we want to say is that we are not experts. We are uh, in the journey, but we are still learning a lot. Um, we... We definitely learn as we go along. Um, we are also, secondly, sharing from our perspective and our experience in the city of Joburg. Um, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> there's actually people living there that's Christians and loving the Lord. And um, so we, <laughs> we really um, invite you to please share if you want to ask us something or if you want to give us suggestions, please feel welcome. Um, then thirdly, third disclaimer is that um, we still have a long way to journey to become an autonomous church. We really hope and believe that we'll get there. Um, and so even though we have a very solid core group, the ministry feels vulnerable often. Lots of times ups and downs. Sometimes we feel like let's pack our bags and go. <laughs> but um, I don't like, know where. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Cape Town. Cape Town. Everyone, Everyone is, is from Cape, Cape Town. Town. There's lots of people who will look, come live with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, but so we can't talk about success to you today, but we <clears> can share. We've seen by God's grace, we've seen fruit, and that's what we can share with you. And just lastly, while I mentioned something about that, in the beginning at the Ken Makar, but um, when we were busy preparing for this talk, I was just really struck by the fact that thankfully Jesus is gathering this church. And um, when I hear all these talks, I feel like, oh, um, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not be discouraged, um, but let's do what we are called to do, what God calls us to do. And, um, yeah, just by His grace, hopefully we can change here and there something <laughs> for, for, his, for His kingdom and His sake. And so we, we want to speak to you about four things, uh, basically. I'll answer four questions from our perspective is how does Jesus gather His church? He's gathering His church, but how does He do it? Has He changed His ways? in the times that we are facing difficult times. Um, uh, kitchen table or church building, we want to share some thoughts on that. Multicultural um, versus cross-cultural. And then the final one is just a 100 meter or a marathon. So we, that, that, that's the four things. And you can may, maybe already guess what we, we are heading into there. But let me start with the first one. Is how does Jesus gather his church today? Um, uh, has he changed his way? And, and I want to, I want to read to you from the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 21, uh, or Sunday 21 question and answer 54. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? This is what we confess if you are used to stand up and confess the, the 12 articles, uh, in your gatherings. This, this is the heart of what we confess is we believe that the Son of God through his Spirit and Word out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. And of this community, I am and always will be a living member. Has this changed? No. This is still how Jesus gathers his church. Uh, he gathers his church through his spirit and his word. And uh, it's just in our tough circumstances in Johannesburg with, with, with rapid secularization, with people really doing all kinds of things, this is still true. 
Um, when Jesus is raised up, Jesus, this is Jesus' promise. He says, when I'm lifted up um, from the earth, I will draw people to myself. And, and, and so this remains true. Uh, if we lift Jesus up, he will draw people to himself. I'm thinking about the whole thing of uh, enemies when, when, when Richard was speaking. Tim Keller also, he used to say, listen, if, um, if I have no enemies as a leader in the church and a as a church, we have no enemies, well, probably we're not lifting Jesus up. But if we have only enemies, then probably we're not lifting Jesus up because Jesus draws people to himself. He, he turns enemies into friends. And that is what we've been doing. We committed to lift Jesus up, to preach about his life and his death and resurrection and about him being king ruling from heaven and about him returning um, to judge the living and the dead and that that is real. And, and if you preach this, Jesus draws people to himself. We know from experience that we can draw crowds in other ways and by other means. Now, it, it happens in our continent, in our world. People draw uh, 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 th uh, things, communities. They call the church together. But friends, we know that uh, if we use other means, it isn't Jesus' church that is called together. It is something, something else. Um, for it to be a church, the gospel of Jesus Christ must be in the center. This is how he, he's since the beginning of time, called people from the darkness into the light. Um, and, and he hasn't changed. The question leading into our second, second point is, however, where should this happen? Where should Jesus be lifted up? Is it only for that hour uh, on a Sunday? Is that where his word and spirit, is that the only space in which he can and, and will work? Uh, and we're convinced now that that may be, might be a bit, I doubt whether it's really different also in our time and age, but, but, but especially in our time, time and age, we think there's an important space that we are miss, missing, a biblical space. And that is our, our second, second point. So, as Thomas said now, that um, we still believe in family worship every Sunday, where there's covenant renewal taking place, and we are part of a liturgical reformed church, so we, we have that space. But what we found is that it's becoming more and more difficult to invite people into that space on first contact. So, maybe they will come if they will come. And if they come they don't stick because it's weird <laughs> you know it's um they they are not being entertained in our worship service maybe or they feel it's it's strange so it's countercultural in our day and age so what we've realized is that or let me say a big breakthrough came when we realized and when we started to invite people around our dinner tables when we invite people into our homes and into our lives. And that's not how we live today. Today we've got high walls and everything, so we don't, we don't even know our neighbors anymore. Well, not in Joburg anyway. So we started living as a real church family, not just for the hour on a Sunday, but we come together regularly, we play together, we laugh together, we cry together, we have fun together. Um, and all of this, we struggle together. All of this around God's word and while the Spirit is uh, teaching us the truth of His Word, uh, all the biblical truths. So we've realized that we've lost the art of biblical hospitality. And that's something that's very close to our hearts in our ministry as in a cross-cultural church. Um, have you ever thought why one of the qualifications for an elder and his wife or his family is hospitality? to be hospitable, yeah, hospitality. <laughs> we believe, <laughs> yeah, not in hospital, but <laughs> <laughs> we believe it is because by God's design, most of our discipleship should happen around a table with food on it. Uh, this is countercultural in our busy, individualistic, programmed city culture. I can keep you busy with the challenges of cross-cultural hospitality, different expectations, one just being when you invite your black brothers and sisters to a bring and braai. 
I've, I've made the mistake. They don't, they don't, they, they don't know about it. They don't, so we've, but through relationship, we've explained to them why we do it. And not the first time, we'll never do a bring and bribe, but then later on, we'll get there. Um, but anyways, but the point is that something happens when you're around your kitchen table sharing a meal or even just some good coffee. And we use the word kitchen table because we had to and still have to do a lot of work in breaking down expectations, especially as the women of the house, because we people must not see this as an act of performance or trying to impress someone with your clean house and uh, amazing dinner. It's about inviting people into our lives, into our messy kitchens, and to invite them to follow Jesus with us as we are trying to follow him and then learn from each other. There's a lot more to say about this, but I think you get the picture of what we mean by a kitchen table. Um, so this is the principle behind us in our congregation where we say we break, we, uh, we organize our congregation into missional communities. That's three to four families that come together regularly, sit around the fire pit or watch rugby together or just have coffee together. Also, ladies and men's groups that um, come together, the ladies with coffee, usually coffee, and the men around the fire, <laughs> and then our DNA groups, that is three to five men or three to five ladies that come together for intentional discipleship with, with, some, with some good coffee. We love coffee. <laughs> so please note that we are not saying that we're getting all of this right and that it's easy because it is very difficult, but we really believe that these kinds of groups and getting together is important vehicles to live out biblical hospitality. <laughs> I can get that word right. The final observation uh, about this is in our traditional churches we found and I must be careful now, but we found that it's very easy to become a member. You attend a few services, you have a quick membership conversation maybe, you become a member, you're in, that's it. And we just realized um, they then are not yet invited into fellow members' homes. They are not experiencing love and care from fellow members, but they are a member. And, 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 and we've tried to turn this around because we believe Jesus actually sets the bar for membership very high. We, when he says things like, you need to take up your cross daily and follow me, that's it's not easy to do that. So we've set the bar a bit higher for membership in CCC. If you want to become a member of Cross Culture Church, we um, first invite you to sign up for a membership course. You have to have membership conversations with the elders, and then um, you become a member while living together with your fellow family members in the church, love each other well. Um, but long before you become a member, you are being invited into our and the other, me other members' homes. You are being loved, you are being cared for um, before you even become a member. And in this way, we've been able to draw people from agnostic and from atheists, the new age, and all the other spiritual backgrounds and see them being exposed to God's word around our kitchen tables. And we've been, have, we had the privilege to see how the Spirit changed them. So I wish we had more time to tell you more stories, but the kitchen table is really a place where we bridge cultural barriers. I don't know if that's the right word, but we really, it's a safe space where we can actually um, get over all the cultural uh, mm -hmm. bridges. Ja, ons is, ons is in die ons pijl vlak. Ons is twee mense. Ja. So ons krijg dubbel tijd. <laughs> but now we only have four minutes. <laughs> Who's the boss here? Not allowed, okay. not allowed. We will, we will tell you. Yeah, we will tell you. Around the so, table. So I will say, I will work something in with this point. Um, so, so, uh, um, so, so by God's grace, we are an, a very diverse community. Small still, but quite di diverse. Jesus has really called very interesting people to himself. Um, and we just, we just realize that this, this can't work if the cross is not at the center. The cross of Jesus 
um, turns us into cross-bearing servants. Uh, and, um, and this is what the New Testament, the first New Testament churches were like. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they were very diverse. Jews, Greeks, rich, poor, owner, slave required, um, to, uh, it, it required of them to keep the cross at the center. Because otherwise, it, it so easily falls apart. And, and through our experience, we realize that unity is not about us. Uh, I mean, that is a very worldly concept, concept, to not see color, to not see differences, to almost act as if we're this multicultural bunch of people that, that everyone is just the same. In our case, it was the other way around. It's actually recognizing differences but loving each other by the power of the cross through those differences. So um, each cult culture uh, have, uh, have a lot of flaws and a lot of brokenness and a lot of idols uh, in, in it, but each culture also has a lot of gifts from God. And it's actually when those cultures clash with, with, uh, with the cross at the center where the idols can really be exposed. I mean, my idols have been exposed in, in the best way through my Zulu and Twana and Koza friends. And through my poor friends, um, we we currently helping two people off the street, um, sending them to Ria, but they were around my dinner table. And that exposes you in new ways uh, and, and challenges you in new, new ways. That is where the cross really um, uh, uh, becomes um, powerful. And this, I believe, was the power of the first congregations in the New Testament. They were, they were like this. They were, in a, in a sense, very strange to their culture. They were countercultural, but in an attractional way. There was something happening there that people thought, I need to go and, and see this. Um, and so, uh, like I said, we d don't believe that we were called to become this gray multicultural bunch of people. We believe that we are united in our diversity and that rubbing shoulders like this turns us into the best versions of ourselves. And what this asks is, um, that we become comfortable with uncomfortableness. Uh, I find within my own church con condition, we hate being uncomfortable. We, we, we hate feeling uncomfortable. But being in a cross-culture community means you, you must become comfortable with un uncomfortableness. Because we make each other uncomfortable. Because they expose me in so many levels, and I them, that it's an uncomfortable space, but the gospel souls um, souls that, that, that uh, I, I believe. And so we encourage each other in cross-culture church to be comfortable with uncomfortableness, uh, to be real and open and honest and humble and to ask questions. If you become frustrated, ask questions. If you struggle, ask questions. Be open to learn, quick to say sorry. And uh, we find that this is just easier and more real and more life-changing, like we said, around the kitchen tables. So what we try and do in family meetings and gatherings is, of course, we have the Bible many times at the center reading together, but we also make opportunities to hear how things are going and we address difficult subjects. I mean, we've, we've talked and cried around our kitchen table about the effects of apartheid. We've become angry together at, at our new government being united around the table with people from different cultures because we have a common challenge that we are facing. But we also address historical differences and challenges and have those conversations. And I'm really convinced that that is one of the way, main ways that we need to address the foundations that are crumbling. Sure, we need to have conferences, we need to be speaking about these things, but around kitchen tables, I mean, something happens there that we take out into the world. And so that brings us to our last point. Do we have a minute still? Yeah, so this feels like a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, sorry, let's almost finish. Okay, so, um, so we realize that um, if you think that church planting and mission work is a 100 meter race, you've got it all wrong. In our experience, it's rather like a marathon. Seasons will come and go. Queens and kings will come and go. Presidents will come and go. Power will come and go. They will be prosperous, great times and they will be difficult challenging times like we are talking about today and it won't be a quick race but in and through all of this as we said in the beginning jesus will be gathering his church through his word and his spirit and we can join him in this by um, being obedient in worshiping him and 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 reacting to our call and what he, he calls us to do um we we 
especially need to be obedient by making sure that my kitchen table is regularly visited by people from all over that would not have been there if it was not for Jesus calling them into, um, into his, uh, his kingdom and for me to play the part of host. And this is how the Holy Spirit calls us to be culture-engaging ministries. And how many times has the Bible not um, called us to be to endure, to hold fast, to keep running the race till the end, even though that finish line feels like it's still a long way off? Um, he calls us to do it, so let's let's run the race, the marathon. Um, I would rather run this marathon than the comrades. <laughs> um, I'll end up with this um, from Hebrews 13. Um, that speaks into all of this. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What a countercultural, strange, but attractional community we won't all be if we can live into this vision of being a church. Mm. Thank you. Well done, you are running well. Here, my van al twee kanten stereo gepraat, nee. En alles was pieren niet en besonders Marcel. So, so we've we've had this uh, splendid picture from an urban setting in Johannesburg. And we really don't want any more GP people moving to Cape Town. Um, uh, but we want some more free states uh, people. So, uh, Sasselburg, there's no uh, a big town industrial setting. Vertel for us. Thank you, uh, Richard. And thank you thank you for the opportunity to be here to be here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to try to do this in English, but I, I was also, I grew up in Heilbronn, which is also just a year in the free state, so English we only used for self-defense. <laughs> all right, so, um, yes, uh, so I think um, what all, we all experience all over the world and also in South Africa and also in Sasselburg is that the foundations are crumbling. So, um, as Richard said, Sasselburg is a, a bigger town, but it's still platteland, rural, with quite big industries. And we also uh, have big challenges. Um, it's just showing that the foundations is also crumbling there. Um, when I started there in 2017, we were a small congregation, about 140 members. Uh, financial challenges just to keep our doors open. Um, many people in our town, in the Fall Triangle, don't know God. They don't love Him. They don't live in a relationship with Him. They are not part of a church. Uh, church attendance itself was not good. Um, urbanization, I think um, maybe the people in Cape Town and Johannesburg uh, don't suffer from that, but in a small place like uh, Sasselburg or smaller town, we lose a lot of our young talent, our young leaders, young people. They go and study, and then they never return to the to the platteland. So um, that gives us uh, challenges itself. I think uh, like everywhere else, there's a huge unemployment uh, uh, levels. Um, a lot of homeless people, uh, major demographic changes in our areas that we all experience. In Sasselburg and the Fall Triangle, drugs is a major problem. 
So a lot of people that we deal with uh, have uh, addiction problems, uh, etc. So we can see the effect of the families that are crumbling uh, uh, and the foundations, uh, etc. And, and we experience it. So what did we do? Um, now I'm not, I'm not saying we are righteous, but uh, what did we do? Or maybe yeah, we are righteous uh, in Christ, but. Um, uh, we started with in our congregation with with house visits, and um, we um, soon had a very big list within the f first six months of people that we know, and that's children, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, family that are not in a church or that uh, is not uh, believers anymore or uh, does not want to go to a church. Um, I can say that list uh, just from my own congregation was within a few months, 170 people on that list that we had names and uh, contact details that is not in a church, but we know them and our members know them. So uh, we started with evangelism and um, also uh, training our congregation to do evangelism. So. Um, I think that's something in the Reformed churches that we don't do well is evangelism. So a lot of the people know we have to do it, but they don't know how. So that was one of my first tasks, just to train them how to evangelize. And uh, from that, we, um, we started with the evangelism ministry group. And then the other thing that we also did is we started with 35 service groups and that's doing ministry work in the congregation and also a lot of the ministry work is, is external um, in, the, in our uh, area. So, um, so um, I think the results uh, from that first year, first year and a half, was this, and that is wonderful to experience that uh, a, a number of people that came to faith, uh, many uh, people started to join our congregation there in Sasselburg and uh, also one of the good thing of the ministry groups and uh, trying to make people involved is that many people in our congregation really got involved in ministry uh, which was uh, something that we were very happy about and uh, our ministry the way we did it I really I think external outward and inward improved so we were happy and uh, attendance also uh, uh, grew quite uh, a lot before COVID. So, um, but we also had challenges and I think Thomas and Erna, it's so nice if you hear other people are also struggling uh, because uh, we also struggled with our evangelism effort. And I just want to share it with you. A lot of um, the people that joined our church and we made the same mistake. We also uh, make them members very easily but they were not from a church background a lot of them or from a reformed background or anything little very little knowledge of the bible uh, of what we confess what we believe very strange ideas strange theologies uh, and they bring this in into your church yeah, and into your small groups etc uh, many uh, people living in sin and they want to join our congregation, um, still um, not married, living together, um, a lot of different things, um, uh, addicts, uh, uh, etc. Uh, many um, left again quickly, as soon as they came in, they saw what we do, it were too foreign for them, like Erna said, the reformed liturgy, the songs, the hymns, the psalms, and they said that's not for them, and they and they left. Um, and uh, our vo vocabulary and our forms is very strange, or very strange to them. Uh, and many um, unemployed uh, people also started to attend our church, and they got food, and they got clothes and they started to bring a lot of other unemployed people with them because you can get uh, food for free there and clothes so um, that just blew us over so we had so many pastoral challenges with people um, 
you know, uh, marriage problems, drug problems, uh, abuse, uh, verbal abuse, uh, violence, and, and I couldn't handle half of it. So, um, and it was also our budget, our ministry, our mercy ministry budget, it took a huge blow because we tried to help everybody, but we could not help everybody. So um, then um, I also, through our church growth uh, deputies, I met Richard, and uh, the, the Lord was good to us. Um, he's faithful always. So uh, we started with a process in um, Sasselberg, which is called Fanning the Flame. I think you, the guys who know Richard will know that's a ministry that he's doing. So um, the first thing that, that we learned from that was uh, the, a big focus on prayer and um, to teach people to really pray and to make a lot of pray, uh, to, to pray. And um, we also um, did not have a, a clear vision and a mission where we are going. So I think Fanning the Flame helped us with that and now we have a clear vision and a mission and, and we are so excited about it and our congregation, uh, most of them are excited about it. Uh, from that we uh, started with the first strategy which we called Loving Relationships. And I think what Thomas and Erna just said is that's so important when people come there, they must experience love. And uh, people in your congregation must know that we are a family and we love each other, we care for each other. But also people that come from outside must experience that first. Uh, so um, uh, what we focused on is a, what we call a warm welcome. When, uh, when people arrive, they must feel welcome, they must feel the warmth, the love. We uh, focused a lot on our ministries of mercy. In Afrikaans ons barmhartigheidswerk, uh, reaching out, and we um, have a, developed a very, I think, a very good biblical uh, based uh, policy on how we do minister, uh, mercy work. Uh, a lot of it is based on Tim Keller's book, also Ministries of Mercy, which is an excellent, excellent book. And uh, we focused a lot on our biblical fellowship or Quinoania. I think that kitchen ta table experience um, that you want. So um, our second strategy that we started with is our small group discipleship. I think uh, we in the Reformed churches uh, did not make enough of discipleship over the years. We did not even understand it correctly. But um, I think now we're starting to understand and we are happy about it. And um, we re just realized how important discipleship is and, and also the roles that small groups can play in that. So the results, um, I think, and that guy can really um, just honor God for that, but, but we are much more a house of prayer than we have ever been in the past. And, and that's, that's just wonderful to see that. We have a clear vision and a mission and we've communicated it well. Um, and we are still busy to communicate it, but I think uh, we are aligned. We know where we are going. Um, our worship services changed a lot. It's much more, um, I think people in, uh, experience it as inspirational, spiritual. Um, we, uh, as I said, the, the pastoral challenges was, were way too, too much for me, myself. So we have now a ministry group with a lot of people that strained in pastoral care and that helped me with that. Uh, then also members who joined through evangelism, I think we did not look so well after them. Uh, we had the uh, uh, conversations, they came to Christ, they became members, but our after care was not good. So uh, now um, we also have a member orientation course so uh, they go through that course, it's four weeks, but they, that just helps them to understand what we are about, what is our vision, uh, our reformed theology, and uh, what they can expect and what they can experience uh, in our uh, congregation. 
we have a regular adult catechism classes where people that's from um, other backgrounds, other church backgrounds or no church background, um, that they, uh, we recommend them very strongly to attend, that they understand uh, what we believe and, and, and what we, um, how we understand the Bible. Uh, we also uh, made a specific point to involve them in our small groups uh, new people so that they can experience love and care and they can disciple and become disciples. And then what we do is, uh, I think the same as, as Thomas, uh, we uh, did not make people members uh, easily. Uh, we, uh, we rather, we call them friends of the congregation and that they can sometimes stay for a year a friend of the congregation before we we make them a member of the congregation. If you are a friend of the congregation, you attend everything. We uh, serve you as any other member, uh, but you, you, you grow with us. And if there are sin, we work on the sin. And if there are, um, um, if you don't, uh, you, it's, a, it's a case of you check it out, check the congregation out, see if you will fit in. But it's also we, um, walking with you and journey with you and then in the end if you really want to become a part of the and you want to become a member then we only make you a member so i think that um, help and then also a body system where it is a one person specifically appointed to walk with a new member to make sure uh, they come and etc so and our mercy ministry is still growing so we are very thankful for that so i'm just quickly going to show you few pictures of um, our warm welcome a, a lot of things that we do you'll see the a pamphlet also for every person who comes through our door uh, we have put up a lot of signs welcome packages uh, for people um, who become members in the end um, a play park for the children um, we all children are also very welcome and the wonderful thing is when we started to focus on our children ministry uh, a lot of children br brought their friends and um, now some of the children's parents are coming with the children so that's a, a key thing is, is the children's ministry our um, mercy ministries I think uh, that is um, a, a whole team effort now which is uh, uh, good and this is our old Kerksal our old church hall uh, this is uh, now our how it looks now, it's a coffee uh, area where people can go uh, there. So um, you'll see, we are reaping a lot of benefit from it. There's a lot of people now staying after the services and, and as having Quenwenia and fellowship with each other. And we're using it for a lot of other things now as well. So, um, so uh, just quickly on our road f forward, we are still busy with evangelism every week. We are people that that we try to reach um, we are still growing and that's i can really only uh, honor god for that but uh, especially younger families that are joining our congregation uh, we which we are very happy about uh, more children our catechism classes are growing uh, so that is is wonderful uh, our small group discipleship um, small groups uh, we are busy now with that strategy, but I think we we are going in the right direction and our, as I said, our mercy ministries. So, um, sorry, to just quickly want to go back. Uh, so next that we are looking at now is especially leadership. So we have big challenges with that in our congregation, also with, with men that are... Uh, not always um, good fathers, uh, good leaders in their own families. So we want to start a ministry also for our men and develop leaders and identify leaders uh, and, and uh, use them. And then also I think evangelism, we want to expand that quite a lot. So, but that's just, um, yeah, I just shared it with you. It's, it's simple, uh, but I think maybe it will um, give you also comfort that if it can happen, in a small reformed church in Sasselberg, then it can also, the Lord can also do it where you are.